Good evening. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Tacoma Pierce County and our co-sponsors, welcome to this forum with candidates running for University Place School District Position 1. My name is Liz Knox. I'm a board member of the League and will be the moderator tonight. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization that encourages the informed and active participation of citizens in government. It also influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League is open to any person who subscribes to the purpose and policy of the League, including men as well as women. The candidates with us tonight in ballot order are Athelda Burke, Whitney Holtz, and Alicia Cunningham. Candidate forums with three or more candidates for a position provide an opportunity to compare and contrast the, can the candidates before voting in the primary election. Before we begin, I want to share the place to text your questions. The phone number to text is 206-310-8965. And a slide coming up to show you that number, 206-310-8965. Candidates will be timed as they answer and may finish their sentences if they receive the signal to end, but may not continue to speak after that. In ballot order, each candidate will be given two minutes for an opening statement. After that, questions will be given on a rotating basis. Let's begin. So, Zelda, would you like to start with an opening statement for two minutes? Oh, I think you're muted. Still can't hear you. Am I? I there you, you go. Okay. okay. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. This is an exciting time for me to run again for the position of school board member for the University Place School District. My heart is in kids, my heart is in education, and that's what I've done all of my life. And I want to continue doing that. I've had a career in education um, for probably over 40 years now, and almost every level from teaching to building principal to administrator. But that's not why I'm wanting to be on the school board right now. I'm wanting to be on the school board because I have a heart for kids, all kids. And I want to make sure that this school district continues the work that it has over the last seven, several years of being the best school district in Washington state. Our academic performance is high. The popularity of this district is high. The people in this district support their students in every way they can. And I wanna to continue to be a part of this by collaborating with my fellow school board members to set policies, look at data and do all of the things that are necessary to continue to make this school district great. The profile for this district has changed substantially over the last seven years, several years, and the school district has kept up with the, that changing profile to honor and to educate the students who move into this district. We are a district now that has many students of color, many students of special, with special needs, many students with English language situations, and many students who come from homes of poverty. I'm excited to work with and make sure that each of those students get the kind of support that they need in the educational arena. Thank you. All right, and now Whitney, it's your turn. You wanna unmute yourself and give your statement. Can y'all hear me? All right. Thank you for having me here and giving me the opportunity to introduce myself. Um, my name is Whitney Holtz. I am a wife, a mother, and an advocate for education and children and parental rights. When issuing his decision on Parham versus JR, Supreme Court Chief Justice Warren Berger stated that the law's concept of family rests on the presumption that parents possess what a child lacks in maturity, experience, and capacity for judgment required for making life's difficult decisions. More important, 
historically, it is recognized that natural bonds of affection lead parents to act in the best interest of their children. And that statement sums up why I'm running for University Place School Board. I'm a parent with two boys in elementary school in the district, and I have a vested interest in their education because I want the best for them and I want them to have successful, fulfilling and happy lives. And I believe that all parents want the same for their children as well. I'm running to help be a voice for all parents and to bridge the gap between us and academia, which as of late has allowed agenda to seep into their decision-making. And I want to foster and encourage truth, trust, and transparency between the board and the people whose lives and futures are staked upon the decisions and policies that they have. I'm not a politician. I have taken no endorsements or money from PACs, action groups, corporations, political parties, or politicians. My support base is strictly other parents and concerned citizens in this district whose driving force is to see our schools fulfill their promise to educate and prepare the next generation for success outside of school be that in the home, trades, military, business, or higher education. All children deserve the support and access they need to reach their academic goals and to set them on the path of success as citizens who are critical thinkers, capable of working and communicating with people regardless of whether they look, think, or live like they do. That is how we create a strong generation capable of handling and solving whatever problems the future may bring their way. And this can only be achieved if we, the adults in charge today, set the example for them. Thank you, and Alicia. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. I'm happy to be here. I um, am Alicia Cunningham and I am a University Place resident and I have been for about 40 years all my life. I'm the Director of Corporate and Community Partnerships for Girl Scouts of Western Washington. And I'm a mom to three sons, two of which attend school in the University Place School District. I too am a product of this school district. Um, and now my children are, they are eight year old twin boys, or I'm sorry, they are 13 year old twin boys going into the eighth grade. Um, and they both have uh, special needs. They have IEPs that attend school. So for me um, in my day job and my everyday job as a mom and as an advocate, um, making sure that our children are championed and supported all the way through is, is the number one component in my daily grind. Um, I see it as an opportunity to run for school board because we need a new fresh set of eyes. We need new energy and we need the optics to change so that we can make change across the board. As Obama has always told us, if you don't do everything that you can to make change, then things will remain the same. And I know that that's kind of where we've been for a long time. So I see the opportunity to inflict change so that it can infiltrate to our students so they can be successful. Um, I have that drive and passion and motivation to do that. Um, every day that I've been a mom and every day that I am a director of corporate to make sure that 25,000 Girl Scouts are championed every day. So when I come home, I make sure that my two sons are also advocated for in every way. So I intend to do that for all of the kids in our 5,000 population school that we have in University Place to make sure that our amazing school district remains amazing because it is amazing. People directly move here just to attend school here. So with that, I think that we owe them to continue to make it the excellent education opportunity that they choose to move here for. Hey, thank you. And our first question is, what do you see as the main job of the school board? And for this, we'll start with Whitney. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself, so I'm already unmuted. Um, I think that the main job, really the only job of the school board, the most important thing that guides everything that we do should be to ensure that all of our students have access to the tools that they need that enable them to leave our schools prepared um, to be successful in life, no matter what direction they choose, whether that's, um, like I said, home, business, trades, military, or higher education. That's it, and all of our policies and decisions should be rooted in achieving that goal. And to achieve that, we need to treat and track each child as an individual, not a group, um, and to give that child what they need to reach their level of success. Not all kids are on the same path, but they all need to be prepared so that they have the knowledge and confidence that they need um, to on the path that they choose. And so as school board, that should be our guiding force with everything and all of our policies and principles should um, be made towards and geared towards making sure that our students have access to whatever that individual student needs. Thank you. Thank you, and Alicia. By law, the school board is supposed to engage with the community to find out what they want as a district education philosophy. 
So number one, the level of engagement. It's a partnership between parent, student, and teacher. And I think that our job as a school board direct, director is to make sure that we're building bridges and we're bridging gaps to make sure that all children are supported so they can have a successful outcome and they can be productive citizens. So I believe that engagement and accountability is number one in order to make sure that all the other things come into play. Thank you. And Athelda. Surprisingly, I agree with both of my op opponents here. Everything they've said is correct. However, I feel that the most important way of, or the most efficient way of getting across those tasks, engagement, making sure that every student gets what he or she needs, is to make sure that you have a strong collaboration with your other school board members. There are five of us. And together, we bring our experiences, our knowledge, and the data that we have researched independently and, and together to find out where University Place really is with academic performance and whether other kinds of social needs that our students need in this district. And around that, then we build policies or we, and we monitor policies and we reevaluate policies to make sure always that we are on the right track. And that is relative to the data that we collect for all of the students in University Place. University Place does have a reputation for high academic performance. And it's not just by chance that that's happened. It's happened because we have looked at the data and together with our superintendent, we have made sure that that continues. And I know that in the introduction, one of my opponents said that um, they need new fresh eyes. And, and I agree with that, but we also need the experience of those who have been on the board for a while and who have educated their students in this district. I educated two girls who graduated from uh, Curtis High School many years Thank ago. You. Thank you, Adelda. We're out of time for that question. Thank you. Um, and the next question is, oops, sorry. What improvements would you make in our school district? And we will start with Alicia. Um, I think that there's many improvements to be made. Um, we're not perfect. Um, and I think that, you know, we have a lot of, of, of end roads to make. I think, number one, we need to have a little bit more engagement from the school board. We need to be able to see our school board members. We need to know who they are. They need to be, uh, you know, we need to be able to access them. Because, you know, when you have engagement, then that, that's how you build relationships. And then that's how you build partnerships to make things happen. So I think that there needs to be... Um, a portion of engagement that needs to happen. I think that we need to remove barriers um, and, and, and stop the creation of inequities and create equities. Because yes, we are beautiful optically on the outside, University of Place as a community and as a district. But inside, we do have a lot of inequities that we need to balance out. Um, our student to teacher ratio for kids of color and teachers of color is not adequate. So you know, there's, there's areas of improvement in that regard. Um, I think that we have a significant amount of foster youth that attend school in this district and, and making sure that they're having the resources that they deserve and that they need so that they can excel and be, um, you know, high school graduates is important. I think that we have a great graduation success rate of 95%. That's fantastic. But then how are we tracking the post secondary um, education? Where are they going? And are we creating those those tractions for them to be able to be successful post high school? Um, and then are they are they able to graduate to, to, to become something with that diploma in their hand? So I think um, there's a, a myriad of things that we could change. And those are just a few that are top of mind for me. Thank you. And Athelda. I agree that there that this is not a perfect district, but we are striving to be perfect through some of the actions that we do. We have policies in place that have been created by the board to improve student learning. We engaged a few a couple of years ago to make sure that we begin tracking graduation when freshmen have the end of the freshman's first semester to see where they are to make sure that they don't get behind. When we initiated a new state. A mandate for math credit, we found that students could only fail one class during their high school career and still be on track for graduation. 
So things like that, making sure that we're tracking right from the beginning of their high school education is important. I would also invite everyone on the line tonight to look at the district website for um, equity and diversity. For equity and diversity, which um, gives an outline of what the district is doing step-by-step step to improve the district. Um, I, I could go on, but I have a suspicion my time is up. But, but we are, we do have in place, we are monitoring and we are revising policies to make sure that every student's needs are addressed and that every student gets what they need. And again, that's, that's part of the improvement that has already started in place. Thank you, and Whitney. Thank you. Um, I agree with um, what they say, this district is great. It's why my husband and I um, moved here. We were South Tacoma um, graduates ourselves, but decided that university place was where we wanted to come and raise our kids. But I do think that we do need more parent engagement um, and transparency with the district and talking to parents on a level that they understand. Uh, reading the website and stuff can be great, but a lot of it with academia talk, um, we just need playing front and center to show us what our kids are learning. Um, I really enjoyed uh, when my son was home that I actually got to see what he was learning in the classroom. To me, that was really important. And that actually um, gave us something to talk about um, and let us go to the library to get books um, on subjects he was interested in. And so I think that that went a, a long way for um, helping parents be engaged in what their kids are learning. And that's something that can be improved on. I would love to see us be one of the most, the most transparent district and, and lead that and give parents direct access to exactly what their kids are learning in the classroom. Um, also creating um, increasing participation in dual credit programs in the skills center. Not everyone is going to a four-year college. I think only 44% of our kids go to a four-year. So making sure that those for college is not a path for them, that they have the skills that they need to be successful and get a living wage job is very important. And then starting that early, um, you know, beating the high school burnout and getting at them in middle school and really getting them engaged, interested, and motivated in their future careers and thinking about that then. Thank you. And the next question is, what plans do you have to help homeless students succeed in their education and be on the right path to graduate? And for this, we'll start with Athelda. Okay, first of all, is identifying who those students are. We don't automatically know who the homeless students are in our district. So identifying them, making sure that we are able to do some type of assessment. And it doesn't have to be the formal assessments that are dictated by the state, but some type of an assessment to make sure that we know where they are. And that kind of work has already started in this district. But identifying who they are, identifying what they need, and then providing the additional resources that they would need. We have other kinds of agencies within our community that can support students who have needs for other things outside of the school that we can also access and making sure that all of our homeless students have outside information, have inside information. And first of all, that we have identified who they are as well. And that could be either done in, in policy or in, in directives or in even conversations as a board with our superintendent. This district is very good at collecting data and we have some people who are very good at, um, at explaining the data to us and triangulate, triangulating the data. So I'm hoping that we continue that to support our homeless students in the future. Thank you. And Whitney. Uh, WASTA has six steps to success um, to help underserved students and none of it has to do with curriculum and all has to do with tracking our kids and following an individual student throughout their educational career mm -hmm. to make sure they're getting the help that they need. Um, it, this is something that I relate to. When I was young, my mother and my sister and I um, experienced a house fire and lost everything. And so we were homeless for a very short period of time, but I, I know how stressful that situation can be and how you can't really focus on anything else when you don't know for sure 
um, where you're sleeping or have that kind of solid background of knowing where your stuff is and things that belong to you. And so that really does interfere with everything that you're thinking. And so working to get take the burden off of that student of making sure that they have a place where they can do homework, accessing outside um, help uh, with for their guardians or parents or for or them to find housing, to find stable placement. Um, and employing counselors that can talk with them and work with them through that situation um, and just ensuring that they feel supported by their school district and that they don't have to worry about trying to take as much of the burden off of them as possible so that they can focus on learning and just finding access um, to programs for them so that they can end that situation if possible. Thank you and Alicia. Yes, we are excellent at collecting data, but we um, don't act on that data always. And we don't act as swiftly um, with the data as we do collecting the data. Um, there are 40 or more homeless students in the district currently, and action has to be taken, um, not just to identify who they are, but meet them where they are and, 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 and not wait for them to come to us to ask us if we have a resource. Um, partnering with strong resources that are doing this job better than we are is, is of the utmost importance. My day job with Girl Scouts allows me to have these partnerships in the community currently that I would utilize my social capital to make sure that we're bringing in active partners that are doing this job effectively and well and swiftly to make sure that there's opportunities for us. We are not like Tacoma School District where they have a high, high number of homeless um, children in their district. And we are grateful for that. However, we have enough to where we need to be doing a little bit more than what we're doing. So I think that having a little bit more action and a lot of uh, data tallying would be more important because we need to actually make sure that we're, we're making good on that to, to, to reach out to those homeless students so they can have an opportunity to be successful. Thank you. There has been much press coverage of critical race theory recently. Some people use that term to refer to discussion of racism in our country's history. How do you think racism in our history should be addressed in the university place curriculum? And we'll start with Whitney. Thank you. Um, I am a multicultural person. I was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana um, and moved here when I was a baby. My mother is white and my father is black and Native American. I understand the um, situation of, of things going on. I have experienced racism. Um, I learned about it in school. I don't think that it was not something, I mean, we learned about the civil rights. We learned the truth about, um, about uh, slavery. There wasn't anything that I felt was hidden from me or that I didn't learn or wasn't educated about. Um, but school for me was a, a place where that didn't matter. It was what I brought to the table, um, uh, how well I did and, and worked hard. And that's what people judged me on at school. And I think that instilling those values in our children is the utmost importance that um, your race, and it's a long history of people from Frederick Douglass to Dr. Ben Carson that have shown that hard work and dedication does pay off. I saw it with my own father. My um, parents married when I was, my stepfather married when I was 10. He's black as well. And um, my single mother went from poverty to having a husband and working together to strengthen themselves and build a business and be successful. So it's something that is instilled in me and that we need to instill in our children. Definitely don't hide the ugly parts, but don't make that the biggest focus of what's going on right now. Letting them know that they can overcome anything and be strong individuals with hard work Thank is you. most important. Thank you so much. And now, uh, Alicia. No matter our color, our background, our zip code, we want our kids to have an education that imparts honesty about who we are, period. Integrity in how we treat others and the courage to just do what's right. And that's how I feel um, in regard to critical race theory. We don't need a theory to be respectful. Um, and I think that that's the number one thing. We teach them at a very young age. And I think that you are not above ever learning how to have respect for others. And that's really what it comes down to for me. Thank you, Anna Thelda. My opinion is that the critical racism theory is, has become a news media effort now and, and for talk shows to get people excited about the critical race issue. 
it's actually been around for years and years, but no one has given it a real definition that would support our students from K through 12. I think that losing it from the, um, I guess from the dialogue in our public schools would be a good thing, but to work on just some of the things that have already been said, respect for each other, understanding each other, knowing that there are different cultures, knowing that there are different races, people at different economic levels, people with different re religions, and even LBQ um, people, so that all our students are aware of those differences and know how to communicate with each other and know how to not judge. Um, at the current time, to my knowledge, to University Place School District has not proposed nor discussed having a critical racism course or curriculum, but they have embedded in some of their social studies classes, some of the information that's really needed about those things I just discussed, the cultures, the races, et cetera. And that's where we need to continue to go. And the website that I mentioned, I think is really good for that. that. And I know sometimes um, data is poo-pooed, but this is not just data, it's actual outlines and information of what specifically the district is, use, is doing about equity and race. Thank you. What steps will you take to ensure that the University Place District does not discriminate and is inclusive and equitable? And we'll start with Alicia. I think that um, out of the 5,000 kids that we have in our school district, 50% of them are kids of color. On the administration side, we have 14.5% of uh, teachers of color. And by that, I mean not a PE teacher or a coach. Um, so I think bridging that gap is part of being equitable and showing reflection of the community. So I think um, that's one way of making sure that we are cognizant of our inequities to create an equitable uh, education system and university place. I think that, um, you know, the kids that are on free and reduced lunch, those typically tend to be a lot of high kids of, of color. Uh, so making sure that we're tapping into more than just providing them a free lunch every day, uh, because technically, if they're qualifying for that, then they're qualifying for a lot more resources. So it's, it's sort of, you know, meeting them where they are and making sure that we're giving them resources to continue their education system effectively other than just lunchtime. Um, so I think that that's another way of making sure that we're bridging those gaps to become an equitable. Um, and then the path for graduation, like I said earlier, um, not everyone is equipped for a four-year university or an Ivy League. Um, careers in technical education is high, and they need to make sure that those kids that uh, you know have that potential to want to go to a trade are going to a trade. Um, and then we're building that bridge for them uh, to, to go there post high school. Um, so that's another way to remain equitable because every child is very different. And there, quite frankly, should be an individual education plan for every student because every path is very different. So I think that combination of those things will create a little bit more equity within our district. Thank you. Nathelda. Again, I hate to keep saying what the district is doing, but in fact, they are doing some things that are very important at this time. Over the last several years, they have increased the number of teachers and administrators and other staff of color. That is, that, that can be checked in that data I keep talking about. Five years ago, we didn't have that 14%. We had much less than that in student and um, staff of color. Um, we also didn't have very many students who were participating in, I think what you would call, Curri curriculum that's devoted to jobs and that sort of thing. We have increased those in our district. We also have increased the number of partnerships that we have with other institutions that inv invite students to look at and be involved in different kinds of occupational training. We also have increased the number of students who are involved in our ROTC programs. And we have, also increase the number of counselors in our district who can provide information to students about the options that they might have beyond high school. And we do have a fairly large percentage of students in this district, which I think is worthy who attend universities and colleges immediately following high school. But we have a lot of other students who do go on to two year 
vocational schools, and a, a multitude of different um, organizations. And I think that that has really been supported by the additional counselors and others that we have added to the district and including Thank you. vocational Thank teachers. You so Thank you. All right, and Whitney. Um, it's important, I think, to define what we talk about when we use all of these words, um, equity, diversity, and inclusivity. Um, so if we're talking about diversity, we're talking about a variety of um, ethnicities represented in our school district. We have that. We are a minority white district. I find it interesting that it's now okay to use a minority as a, um, a positive in a district, kind of backwards for me, um, and the timeline of history here. But uh, if we're talking about equity, we're talking about uh, making sure that we're providing additional help to any students that need it, whether they're talking about um, making the buildings accessible for different abled students or providing um, courses, AP, honors, or even IEPs, whatever that student needs, then, then that is an equitable solution that is obviously good. Um, if we're talking about inclusive, we are talking about maintaining an environment that is based on the golden rule, which is just respecting everybody and doesn't force people how to think um, but, or believe, but requires that everyone treat each other with respect then I think that that's a good thing. We don't want robots. We want kids that are prepared for the real world, which different opinions exist and they can all work together. Um, but if we're talking about any of that along a racial segregation, um, segregating them to categories based on race or alleged social positions, then I think that we need to put a full stop because we don't admit groups into schools, we admit individuals and each child comes with their own unique needs, strengths and challenges. And we have to rise to meet that occasion for that child and that's the one and only goal of the district. Thank you. Next question. In 2020, the Washington State Legislature passed Senate Bill 5395, which requires all public schools to provide comprehensive sexual health education by 2022-23 school year. The instruction must be age appropriate, medically and scientifically accurate and inclusive of all students using language and strategies that recognize all members of protected classes. How do you recommend that the school district address this requirement? And for this, we'll start with Ethelda. You're muted, Ethelda. You unmute, there it goes. Okay, the, the school district has already started these conversations because of the mandate that came through for the HIV training. And in some instances, you really can't teach HIV training without um, dipping into sexual, um, sex education training. So I think the conversations need to continue. I think we need to continue having the, the talks with our community that we've had in the past about what their thoughts are around this. I think that we do, again, need to look at the data and see what is really needed, who is really needing it, and, and how we need to deliver it to them. Again, no decisions have been made yet. We are studying, first of all, with the state mandate. We're studying what, what our community wants, and we're looking at what we know our students that we have had in our classrooms over the last few years really need in order to be successful citizens. Thank you. And Whitney. 5395 was kind of a big explosion on the state. And so I think this is something that um, a lot of parents are gonna be watching very carefully. And I think this is just one of several things going on in schools that is really bringing parents to the table. And I think that that's great. Um, we need more conversation um, with parents and bringing them in as stakeholders. So I think definitely um, convening a fair group of, of um, parents along with um, not people knowledgeable, doctors or nurses or whatever that can sit and evaluate the curriculum um, that the school is considering is important. Uh, I think transparency, again, is going to be a necessity for parents, um, putting everything out there that the students are going to learn, links, um, outside speakers, um, a list of everything so that parents really feel like they know exactly what their kids are getting in the classroom is going to be super important. 
Um, and then fully supporting the opt out for the parents who still decide that they don't want this in their school. I think that that was a big issue. Um, making sure that outside of the classroom, these um, curriculums aren't integrated into any other classrooms um, or their student won't be um, getting any of this stuff anywhere else. So making sure that we have an easy, clear opt out for parents is gonna be key as well. For opinion on school resource officers, do you support them? Why or why not? And for this, um, uh, a question before I go, Alicia, did you answer that last question? I'm so sorry. No, I it's you. okay. Go I was like, please. are we starting a new question? No. Okay. So sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so we live in a very different time right now um, where there's access to information a lot faster um, than it ever used to be with social media and and phones and things like that. So I think it's level-headed to think that you would want an educated perspective on sex education for your children because typically nowadays they will get information from a lot of different sources that may or may not be confirmed or, or permitted by the parents. So I think that that's first and foremost. So if you are going to get information, it should be from an educated source. Um, secondly, I know that we do have an opt-out option, which I think is great because not all parents um, are going to be okay with that. And I understand that. And I think that that's important. They need to have um, an, an opportunity to have open dialogue about what exactly is going to be taught to their children, at what age, at what level, how frequent. I think all those come into play as well as just making sure that you have their parents' permission, no different than we're gonna be doing swimming for PE now. So is, it, is that okay with you? This should be no different just because the topic is heavier. Um, so I think that as long as you have parents' permission and they give them the option for opting out, and then just understanding that, you know, if you're going to be delivering information at this magnitude, it should be from an educated source. So um, I know that we're continuing to have open dialogue about it. And I think that as long as we keep parents on the forefront, because it is a decision that should be made for, you know, by their, for their children, um, I think that, that then we can move forward with whatever um, decisions that we have to make as long as we're considering the students, the families, and the parents. And the parents have, have the utmost regard to be able to say what they feel is necessary for their students. Thank you. And again, I apologize. Um, the next question, what is your opinion on school resource officers? Do you support them? Why or why not? And we'll start with Whitney. Um, absolutely. I think that um, it's important to have um, a safety measure in schools. Uh, our world is not exactly the safest place. And so I think having um, someone skilled and trained for emergency situations on campus um, is important. And with policing being overall um, big in the news right now, I think it's an also an important opportunity to teach our kids how to judge people as individuals rather than as groups or what you might be hearing or thinking about other people um, or how other people like them are acting. It really is an individual. So I think that that's an important um, to do. And uh, I think that the discussion and the concern about theirs is that it is a uh, pipeline for school to prison, um, depending on the school district. And we don't have that problem in university place, I don't think. Um, so we really need to be dealing with the problem that is concerning our district. I think our officers are great. Um, and it helps bring about the feeling of safety in our community, which is awesome. Um, one thing that can be done, though, I think is when I've been talking to teachers, is they're more concerned not about the school resource officers, but about their ability to discipline students um, in the classroom and their hands being tied, uh, not having consequences. Or um, one story of a teacher told me um, with kids stabbing someone in the classroom with pencil and just got sent to the office for a cookie. So looking at those options instead of our resource officers for what is causing um, discipline issue later on in life, I think is probably a better, better uh, course of action. Thank you. Alicia. Um, when I was in school, uh, we had these, they weren't named resource officers. They were renamed to something a little bit different and they engaged with us so much so that we didn't even realize what they did and who they were. Um, I know that they are there to protect children. Nowadays, we live in a different climate than we did 20 years ago. Um, every day is changing and there's things that are not happening in our community that could happen in our community. Um, and, and we have a very low crime rate, but that doesn't mean that things can't happen. Um, so I think that, you know, the negative narrative that, that 
police bring right now, um, I think can be deviated in a lot of ways because you can engage with the students to let them know that you are not a negative connotation or a negative narrative um, to, to sort of flip that script a little bit and, and still be there for them and keep them safe. So I think that the approach needs to be different and the outcome and results will be different. But I think that it, it's definitely something for the safety of the students, um, but the delivery is everything. Thank you. And Ethelda. Am I unmuted now? Hello? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I think it's up to the district at this time what is really needed. And the assessment needs to be made of what they really believe is needed for the police, whether we, or not we need police officers in the school. Sometimes it's not the students that we're protecting um, with this these type of officers, but the outside people who come in, you know, the danger stranger, there are strangers that come in. And as we've noticed in a lot of the news media lately, there are people who come into the school and are dangerous to our students, to our staff members. So an assessment needs to be made based on what the district staff has experienced what the students have experienced and whether or not they're really needed again. We have had them in University Place School District, as you know, just prior to COVID, I think that we no longer had them maybe six months before, but I think that there, there may be some discussion at the district level about whether or not we would do that again in the fall. But again, we, we base it on the safety of all the people who are on our school campuses, the students, the staff, and any of those dangerous people who come on the, the campuses to develop a, a dangerous situation. Thank you. Child performance is predicated on teacher effectiveness. In addition to kids, parents, and board members, what should be done to empower and support teachers? And Alicia, you go first. I think teachers have the hardest job, but the most important job out of out of all the jobs. I think that they are impacting a person's life. There would not be doctors or any other profession out there if it weren't for teachers at the beginning of it. So I think that empowering them and championing them and making sure that they're supported as well, because if I naturally they see our children just as much as we see our children and um, you know they spend a significant amount of time with them every day so I think it makes sure that they have their resources making sure that we're in a collaborative partnership and we're communicating making sure that there is you know if there's a barrier of some type for communication or homework or anything that we make sure that we're meeting them in the middle to, to have a partnership you know I have to sit down every year for IEP meetings and I know that it's a partnership it is not just me dropping them off at the end of every day and hoping for the best it is me also, you know, they work on things at school that I'm working on at home and vice versa. So I think that making sure that they're supported is very important because they're making sure that our students are supported every day. So whatever it is that they would need, resources, classroom supplies, you know, making sure that we're answering their emails and communicating with teacher conferences and calling those meetings whenever we need them um, is, is a partnership. And we have to make sure that we're, we're doing our end of the bargain because naturally that's that's how a partnership creates that's how the relationships get strengthened um so so they're very important and we need to treat them as such thank you Ethelda. teachers are the most important part of our educational system and yes we should support them in every way we can university place has a unique relationship with their teachers and their administrative staff. And I think they also have a unique relationship with the parents in this community. And I, and I feel that they feel safe and open to communicating with parents at all times. When you create an environment for teachers to work in, you want to make sure that it's safe, that they are compensated appropriately, that they are listened to, that they have access to the best and latest professional development, and that we do have linkages in a sense for teachers as well so that the board and others can listen to them as we have our linkages with the community and have some profound questions that we ask so that parents can have an opportunity to give their opinion. So yes, teachers are, I, I can't say more than that they are the epicenter of our entire educational system. Thank you, and Whitney. 
Yes, um, watching teachers juggle um, the classrooms and, and learning a new program this year, I was really amazed and in awe at how our district really came together and, and the teachers were amazing in handling everything. Um, the number one thing that I saw was parental engagement um, is, is key to supporting them and really making sure that that child has support at home. And the way that the district can foster that is really bringing the parents into um, their child's educational experience with, and I think to do that, we need a, it should be a push of information from the district instead of a pull from parents so that they really feel um, welcomed and encouraged and, and urged to join in on their kids um, educational process. Uh, talking with teachers, the number one thing that I have heard is they just want to teach. They want to be allowed to inspire and motivate their kids, um, not burying them with too much bureaucracy and red tape and all this stuff. They just want to get back to basics. They want to teach ABCs and one, two, threes and leave the rest up to us, the parents, which it really should be our job um, in the end. So I think that just making sure that they feel valued, which I hope after COVID, every parent <laughs> made sure to get their teachers um, gifts every teacher after year after this, every teacher appreciation day, um, listening to them, making sure that they have the support that they need um, within the classroom and, and with the administration and on the board if necessary to make sure that they feel valued. Thank you. What should parents' involvement in their children's education look like and how can the school board foster that? And we'll start with Ethelda. I think that we are already try, attempting to foster that by having our parent linkages so that we can actually have critical conversations with our, our parents about what's happening in our school district. Um, I think other than the linkages is to ensure parents that they have someone to talk to about their issues and their suggestions on a one-to-one -one basis. And I happen to know that our superintendent, his staff and every teacher and staff person in this district is open to having conversations with parents. And so that's very important. I think that the um, quarterly newsletter that goes out from the district that keeps parents up to date on what's actually happening in the, in the district, special programs that are being offered, those types of um, continuous communications are also good. Also the emails that are sent out to the entire district family by our superintendent on a fairly regular basis is important as well. So I think we are making a, a real attempt in this district to communicate on a regular basis with our with our students, parents. So I think we're on the right road for that. Thank you. And Whitney. Um, I think that systems work how they're designed to work. And so if um, parents aren't involved in the kids' education, it's kind of how the system is set up. And so reworking that system um, again, I said it a million times, I'm going to be just a um, robot on this, but um, transparency for parents is key. And I think we see around the nation that parents want to see exactly what their kids are learning in the classroom. They are clamoring for information. And it really did, um, personally for me, like I said, foster um, more understanding with my son and allow us to um, work together and even extend his learning outside of classroom, finding things he was interested in. So um, the unprecedented transparency, a push from inf of information from the schools. Um, we're doing a good job with the peach jar um, things that come in, text messages that come in, opportunities for parents to get involved, but really making it a fun process for them. Um, more communication. I think that sometimes um, talking and, and only hearing things during, you know, a mid-year e exam of whether or not your student is, is doing good or not is a little too late. So just really having that one-on-one -on -one with the teacher where the teachers are coming to you um, whenever there's a problem in your student's um, um, academic career and getting it before you get that transcript in and talking to parents in a language that they understand, giving them the information, not in this academia talk that I think a lot of um, people in education a long time understand, but what parents get. Thank you. And Alicia. Well, 
like I continue to say, it's a partnership and you have to have visibility amongst the school board in order to know that they are there to be seen and for you to be heard by them. Um, I think that, you know, we do have a lot of systems in place, but those systems are not necessarily valuable to those that don't have access to those types of systems. Um, so yes, we do a fantastic job of, of uh, reiterating information and getting that out into the community for those that are set up for success in that fashion. But again, that's an equity piece that we're not great at, which is making sure that we're infiltrating that information to those that can't get it uh, through a newsletter and, and all other sources that we send it out in. So our due diligence is not just to send the communications out to the masses and assume that everyone's getting touched on because then the parents can't communicate with the teachers or the students or the board. So there's a lot of different variables that have to sort of get changed or worked out in order to make sure that we're actually keeping in touch and creating those relationships with all the parents and communicating with them in the way in which they communicate or have access to communicate. So um, I think that that's the first order of business before we can get any further and making sure that our relationship is strengthened between parents and the district. Thank you. And that was our last question for this evening. We had many questions coming in from our audience and we weren't able to get to all of them, but um, it's time now for our closing statements and each candidate will get one minute for a closing statement, and that will go in reverse order to the opening statement. So we will start with Alicia. I have had to advocate for my kids right away, early. They were premature boys when they were born, and I either had to sit in a corner and get scared and worry and wait for someone to tell me what the outcomes were going to be, or I was gonna roll up my sleeves and learn the narratives and, and make sure that they were successful. Um, and so obviously I chose door number two, um, and I do that in my daily work, and I do that as a mom for my, my sons to advocate for their needs. And I plan to do that for all the other 5,000 students um, whose parents feel like they're not being heard and whose students are not being successful because they're not advocated for properly. Um, so I intend to work very hard, um, use my platform, use my voice, my social capital and all the things that I possess that strengthen things to add value to the table. I love my community. It, it, it raised me practically. Um, Everything I know has come from University Place, and I am proud to be able to show my children the same, the same lifestyle. Um, and I'm proud that my kids attend school in University Place, and, and we didn't have to move here in hopes that we would get a place to live here, that we moved here when I was a baby, and my kids have just naturally only known this community. Um, so I look forward to supporting our community to make it even better, bigger, stronger than it is right now, and create resources and access. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Whitney. It was an honor to be able to talk to everyone today. I really enjoyed it. I just wanna reiterate what the goal of a school district should be, and that's just to produce the next generation of critical thinkers that are prepared to enter this world with the skills and knowledge to be successful at home, at their careers um, and in life. And everything that we do and every decision that we make should come up to that one solitary goal in mind. Um, it's our job to motivate and inspire students to find within themselves the desire and the ability to work hard to achieve their dreams and to ensure that all children are treated with equal dignity and respect. Um, the policies and goals for intended outcomes set by the school board should always respect the rights and responsibility of parents to be the instillers of the morals and values in their children. And the board's response to legislation should always be um, in balance to that ideal. Uh, schools are a place for education and not social engineering. And what we're seeing across the nation are some school boards that have lost sight of that. So, and parents are frustrated with a system that's designed to keep them out of the picture. And it's time to fix that system because parents are demanding truth, trust, and transparency, and we need to give that to them. I'm a parent, just like a lot of the people watching. And like many of you, I'm concerned. Um, Thank you. And I want to get back you. to basics. Minutes up, sorry. Ethelda? I intentionally moved to University Place School District nearly 50 years ago because of the school system here and to get my daughters educated in a system that was a proven district. I believe in University Place and I, although I do not have students in the district at this time, I have many friends and a goddaughter who attended here actually in preschool. I believe in this district. I want to continue working on the board. Um, We've all talked about the diversity of our district, 
but I'm a diverse board member. I would be one of the older board members, but I bring with me the love of children and the knowledge that I've had since I was in the classroom and went all the way through the top of education. Um, you, need, you need a variety of school board members who do have different backgrounds and, do, and who are of different ages and do have different experiences that they can bring to the school board. Being a parent is a wonderful thing in the district, but also be, being a parent and grandmother is also, I think, helpful to this board of directors. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everyone for participating in the forum. Thank you for the candidates and to Terry Baker, our timekeeper this evening and to Cynthia Stewart for her technical assistance. Thank you also to the nonpartisan co-sponsors in alphabetical order, BIO, Black and Indigenous Organizing, Grit City Co-op, Latinos Unidos of South Sound, NAACP, CENCO or South End Neighborhood Council, Summit Waller Community Association, Tacoma Pierce County Affordable Housing Consortium, the Urban League, Vibrant Schools and the YWCA. Before you vote on August 3rd, also check out the League of Women Voters online voters guide, Vote 411. You can find it at www.vote411.org. And you can go to votewa.gov to check your voter registration. Both sites identify ballot issues and candidate information specific to your own voting precinct. We encourage everyone to use that as a resource in addition to the standard voters guide. You will find other candidate forums and a link to the recording of this one at our website at Tacoma Pierce League of Women Voters org. So thank you again for being with us tonight. And please remember to vote by August 3rd. Have a great evening and thank you again to our candidates.